All right, we are we alive. Hey, everybody, <laughs> we alive on the internet because it's 2020, and that's only where people exist anymore. We had a small little break um, in which we could actually see people, but now we're we're back to just seeing people online. Anyways, uh, hi, my name is Justin O'Coin in the SEA. I am Marichal Remy de la de Gascon, um, and we're gonna. I'm here with some of my good fencing friends and we're going to just shoot the shit on this thursday night because what else we're going to do oh uh, yeah all right i think i did say 2020 it's 2022 yeah 2020 part three uh anyways i'll let everyone quickly introduce himself um we'll just kind of go around we'll start with eric thanks uh hi i'm eric uh i was in the sca water rafael di marisi uh i am in the mid uh i'm gonna pass it down to you asha Oh, hi, I'm Asha Ember in the SCA. I'm Anna Reima von Wolfenbüttel, uh, Master Anna Reima von Wolfenbüttel. Uh, I am also in the mid realm at present. And uh, uh, on you, Donovan. Oh, hooray. Uh, yeah, I'm Tim Walsh in the SCA. Um, I'm Donovan Chinook, um, I guess Master Donovan Chinook, if we care. Uh, and <laughs> I'm back out in the East. Hooray. We, we, we did it. We introduced ourselves. Hooray. We did it. We, we did it. Yeah, that was the hard question. Everything's easy from here on in. Yeah. So just for for people kind of like watching at home on the YouTube, I got the uh, the the stream chat on, so you can drop questions in there. We got some questions ahead of time. It's probably going to be just us kind of rambling and stuff as well. But I'll try to keep an eye on that chat and stuff. Um, do, should I jump into a question right away? Does anyone have something they want to want to sign if, off with? If you don't jump into a question right away, it's going to be the four of us kind of staring at the cameras and just kind of like scratching our heads and wondering how to make this go. So yes, please start a conversation. All right, let, let's start. We'll start with a, uh, an easier one. What are the merits of the Armor as Worn tournament? Ooh, I love that one. I love the merits of the Armor as Worn tournament because if you're a badass, you can show off how badass you are by wearing as little armor as you can and still winning. I mean, they're they're fun as and they, yeah, and like they give you they give people a reason. To, so like normally when you're fencing, there's no reason to wear anything that's heavy or restricting right. motion or anything because like you're all assumed to be wearing the same stuff. But with armor is worn, like, yeah, put on that heavy ass breastplate. You're immune to everything in the chest now, rock on. Like there's a reason for it. And that's that's kind of what I could benefit right there. It is cool. I mean, like in all seriousness, what I was saying too about the feeling like a badass, there's just kind of a fun little side to it that kind of goes along with that, which is you can kind of set your own difficulty level to a certain degree. So you can go, hey, I need a little bit of a leg up, but nobody is gonna fault you for it. You can actually try, you can see what it's like to be slightly encumbered and have that, that slight advantage or figure out if it, it really is an advantage for what you're doing. It's, it's just a whole new dimension you can play around with. Yeah, yeah. I can also just add in uh, another way we can relate to what they were doing in period, right? A lot of these books are written for people fighting in armor or are based in armored combat and then other things will derive from that. Uh, and the way you fight in armor, right, the Germans call harness fechtum, or it's just like armor, uh, fecht, like har uh, harness fighting, right, is you're not throwing cuts to the body, right? You're not swinging around and what, right? It's, it's a more constrained thing. Your vision is crap. Uh, you're trying to stab inside these joints and it's a different game and a different mentality than what we're used to. I mean, yeah, have I you guys ever gotten to be in like full harness to do this sort of thing? No. I haven't. I have... I've only gotten to do breastplate and like cops and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I haven't done any armor as worn tournaments yet, sadly, but I did wear my my breastplate and stuff to like the last war point when I was general, because I'm like, I wanna. I want to have this like general experience. I walked on there with the armor. I felt I've never felt safer walking into a Penzik battle in my life. <laughs> it was the it was the first time we did the combined battle, so like there were people we were a little unsure of how that was gonna go uh, and stuff. But man, I felt very very safe. <laughs> yeah, the only armor is worn tournament I've fought in um, was out in the mid realm after I flew out there. So. 
I had no armor with me because armor is heavy and takes up space and airlines do not give out uh, free weight and space for your uh, breastplate. Not that I own one, but yeah. Trick so I into the airport. Yeah. Yeah. I, w I was um, convinced that I should fight in it wearing my, my armor of two layers of linen and uh, that's it. Uh, and it was still, it was still a blast. It was still, uh, still a ton of fun uh, being the person who can actually still move for speed. <laughs> oh yeah my best my best experience with emma is worn was oh my god this is eons ago at a simple day sir crispin came out and was doing kind of a deed of arms and he came out full cup of pa just like total 16th century knight style nice. and uh love the guy if you're if you're out there somewhere watching this at some point that was so much fun i kicked his ass um <laughs> But I had to do it and like constantly getting behind him and going for the joints, going for like the, the knee joints and the armpits and stuff like that. And it, I have never felt that vulnerable in a fight or like <laughs> I had to be so perfect. It was actually like in a strange way, more of a vulnerable feeling than I've gotten in like high level tournaments. So I yeah, thought it was a great experience just on the not armored person side. <laughs> I yeah. found that same tournament against him. I hadn't thought about it in a while. And I essentially was like, oh, crap. I have this one tempo to fire. I wasn't getting behind him. But he, like, he raised up into Guardia Alta. And I was like, oh, an armpit. And just launched. <laughs> yeah. like, if I don't fire at this moment, I will die afterwards. And then I got it. And I was like, ah, oh, OK. And kudos to the guy. He had some real stones doing this. Because it was like, I swear to God, 101 in the shade that day. And he'd been fighting all day long. And like, he definitely had the uh, the, the the look of a, of a period night, as you might imagine, somebody just like completely sopping with sweat. <laughs> oh. Thinking about um, exhausted, I think we may have exhausted this topic. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right, so here, I'll grab another one. I don't think there's anything from the chat quite yet. Uh, there's, there's a bit of trolling going on in the YouTube chat that's to be expected. A lot of our Rx mid-round friends are having a grand old time out there in, in chat land. Uh, but well, let's talk about our favorite ways of winning a fight. Like, what's your favorite technique or setup or sequence? Or maybe just a, like, do you really like, you really like hitting people with a Jirata, like that kind of thing. Or I know Donovan's probably like, I just like winning, so I don't care how I do it. Yeah, I just want to hit them in the most efficient way possible and call it a day. Like, You were no fun with this question. My favorite is when I stand there and they just run into my sword for me. That's the best part. What about that one thing you do? You know, that thing. Oh, yeah. So, Otto's referring... So this one time we walked into a tournament and I was like, oh, hey, uh, yeah, I don't hit people in the face at all. You know, that's not what's going to happen. And then just like 20 <laughs> fights in a row, straight to the face. I mean, there's also the time when you and I just like double on each other constantly, you know, in a, you know, in a high prestige tournament, because that that's a thing that happens. No, the better part was the sound effects. Of we like had gone like essentially like Japanese samurai style like passed by each other kind of thing, and then we stood there for a second. And we're both like, did that happen? I think we both doubled, and I think you just opened with. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So kind of, like, and I just did the same thing like out of my face because we had both draw cut each other on how. Be because we are thing. serious students of the sword who take ourselves very seriously in serious tournaments. So I'm really just asking this question because I'm just trying to figure out what everyone's favorite thing to do is. So I have an idea of what to expect when I fight you all next. So you this is me just trying to get quiet. dirt on you all. <laughs> What's up? Sorry. So you notice how I'm being quiet on this Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought my answer was great. You should just run yourself into my sword. Problem solved. Note yourself. Yours is great. Mine is really simple. It's I, I have three things that I do. I either hit them in quarta, hit them in seconda, or let them whiff and tag them in Tursa. That's about it. Like it's, I'm funneling people to one of three inevitabilities, but it's all very structured. I try to be like very by the book in the way that I fight. Um, and like for me, I just, you know, love it when a plan comes together. Yeah, you know, just, <laughs> just get people where they're going and like thank them for doing what I wanted them to do. 
one of the things I've had a lot of fun playing with more in the past couple of years, and Asha, I'm sure you'll understand this a little better as our token lefty in the room, uh, is actually knowing how to use the outside line. Right? Mo like lefties kind of have to by default because, you know, you, right, if people line up, they will default to trying to be on the inside because it's, right, it's the stronger cut, essentially, even if you're not cutting. Uh, and if you're both righties, no one's fighting over that. But if it's righty versus lefty, the lefty is going to end up with the opponent on their own outside line. We just, yeah, we're just like, cool. You want the inside line? That's great. Because like mechanically speaking, you're actually really mechanically strong on the outside line and people neglect that. Yeah. There's a stupid thing that people do when they, when they fight. Let's see if I can do this with my fingers. <laughs> right? So you've got two, there we go, two right-handed people. Ask it. You have people lining up and they, instead of lining up with their front foot, like in a line to each other, they line up square to each other. And so you've got my right foot is lined up with your left foot and your left foot is lined up with my right foot instead of our right feet both being lined up together. This is assuming they're both right-handed. And so they just sacrifice the entire like concept of the outside line. There's no outside line in that fight. As a lefty, I'm like, you want to do that really? Like you just you 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 want to gift wrap your armpit too while you're at it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll just show up on the outside line and like lock my shoulders in. Uh, or I did an article a bit ago how Capoferro and Gigante have different lunges in second, where Capoferro mm -hmm. is trying to maximize measure by keeping his arm behind him and staying profiled and then just turning his hand. And Gigante is like, I want their sword and I want it gone. And he turns his shoulders into it. Uh, which is kind of how Fabris is just setting up. And like, that is a very powerful shape. And I can just run through people there. Uh, and I show up in their outside line, they're like, oh, I don't I don't know how to do that side. Yeah, like what Fabris I, has so many good know. plays on the outside line. Like, especially like one of my favorite cloak plays is just set set someone up on the outside line and you do that thing where you kind of take your take your feet and then you just rotate on the balls of your feet to, to lock your hip into it. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's just, it's all over except for just like running straight through them. Um, and yeah, like you said, people are just like, what do I, I'm on the outside. What? Oh shit. And what's also great about that, because no one likes to be on the outside line. They want to be on the inside that they're very predictable what they're going to do next, which is fantastic. Like, sure. I'll, if like if I if I want to hit someone on the inside line, I know they don't want to be on the outside. I'll just find them on that outside. Oh yeah, they will. They'll either stand there and die, or they will disengage back to the inside. And I have answers. The first one, eat better. But like second one, <laughs> you know, I have all my regular tools for that problem. Cool. I know where you want to go. Thank you. We're gonna go there in a second, but I'm gonna make you feel uncomfortable about it while we do it. <laughs> it's like invitations work. Huge if true. That, right. Uh, we did get one question from the YouTube chat. Uh, this is, would you rather be better at the basic lunge or at the girata? I, I'll start off with this one. I would say like, if I had to choose, I'm not sure if this is like, choose which one to be better at or like which one you think you would like to put more XP in currently. I would say if I had to choose between the two, definitely like, the, the basic lunge, like, can never be better at that. But I could probably put more XP on working on my Jarda because I'm dog shit at it. It's like, like, I'm not very good at that one. But definitely the basic lunge all day. All day. Yeah, yeah uh, same. So like, I, I think I've only ever done that in practice. And, like, Gigante wrote his book in a straight line where, like, page one, lunge. Page two and three, find and gain and lunge. All right, and then we're going to disengage. And then we're going to deal with their right. Like, this is the first part just goes straight and, like, hey, you should, you know, get. I realize there's all of these fancy plays on these permutations with this paint or that. Like, you should do the basics really well if you want to murder people. We're having a lunge. Yeah. Like, you know, I've, every time I've, that I lose, it's basically because I've screwed up something in my basic game. I don't think I've ever <laughs> lost because I messed up a Jirata. So I don't think I've ever tried to do one in an actual tourney or something. I've, I've landed a couple of Jirata in tournaments, but if there's no way you, like I 
thought that I was setting up for them by any stretch of the imagination. Like I used them as they were intended to be used, which is my brain screamed, oh shit. And I threw my, I threw my shoulder out of the way and I didn't fall over afterwards. So it looked cool. Um, but it was a close thing and I could have looked like a complete idiot out there. So yeah. Um, but other than that, yeah, like fine sword, constrained sword, lunge. Hey, Remy, can you do us a favor because you have more space behind you? Can you show a Dorada, just for anyone who hasn't read a lot of Italian books? I will see what I can do. I have literally, like, there's a wall right here. I'm going to do this, like, from a slightly squat position because I don't have a ton of ton of room. All right. All right. There's basically a body void. Oh, my God. This is going to be a nightmare. Oh, my God. All right. Wow. (laughs) And I'm also, like, blurred. That's okay. So I'm in my... Fantastic Italian stance, right? I'm gonna throw my off shoulder, my back shoulder offline, and then kind of like twist. So you got like this basic version where you can pass with your back leg past the front leg behind it uh, to really like get super offline. You can have your hand here or there, but it's a cool way. You basically void an offline towards your sword side by throwing your back shoulder off the the line of attack, um, and it looks really fucking dope if you land it. I've only like, I've tried it in pickups a few times. I think I've landed it successfully once and it was butt ugly. It was not a pretty Gerada by any means. Um, if I don't die when doing it, that's a victory in my book. But I haven't tried it in a tournament because it's just way, way too risky. And like reading some of like the French fencing masters, like, yeah, you can do this. They're great in the cell. But like, if your life's on the line, these vultures or like Geradas, maybe not the best idea with with sharps and stuff oh yeah i love those pieces of advice uh manchiolino who in like 1530s one of the bolognese masters uh doesn't have a sword in two hand section he just has a single paragraph at the beginning where so he has the bolognese has spotted di joko and spotted di filo so spotted is sword joko is play right like the fencing sword as opposed to filo is like sharp right the murder sword uh, cause even then there was like, they, they, you know, like, just like martial arts now differentiate between like sparring and sport and like the street or the, <laughs> you know, the all the things. Uh, and he's like, Hey, those fancy high guards, great for spotted to joke. Spotted to feel it. Don't use them. Stop doing those things. Put your sword in front of you and stab them. Done. Yeah. Things start to look a lot more like, like the later period. Yeah. Uh, the, the late 16th, early 17th century fencing when you take away all of the silly crap you're really not supposed to do. I mean, and, and then, you know, I, I think on the one hand, yeah, you're absolutely right. Once you get rid of the extraneous crap, like it, it starts to look more similar until you add back in like the obnoxious social like baggage that comes comes with the violence. And then you're like, well, but maybe you want to stand there with like your your chest out and your your weapons up because you look really cool and brave that way. And that's just as important. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is like the, the, so, the, all that social aspects of how society like molds the martial art and, and vice versa and, and that kind of stuff, which I am no, my, by, by no means an expert in, but I do find it kind of interesting. Uh, let's see. There's a couple, here's, here's a fun question. All right. So, do cloaks, so this is a two-parter. One, do cloaks need to be used more? And two, if not, why are you bad at cloak? That was just sent in, so. <laughs> I'll send this, yeah, I'll, 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 do, I'll let yeah, Donovan kick this one. Cloak more. Yeah. Cloak is great. I love it. It's fun. Um, and if you want to use cloak like properly, that's great. If you want to take like a doily and hold it like between two fingers and just like whip it around, that's also cool. And you should absolutely use that when you are fighting me, please. <laughs> so yeah, no, like cloak. actual cloak though, like, like who actually does that fights with a cloak properly? I mean, come on, it's the FCA. You've got the figure eight whippy do thing that everybody was doing in the night. <laughs> right, exactly. It's. You'll notice it's it's generally a lot of people with master in front of their names these days <laughs> actually use a cloak the way it's supposed to be used. I, I think they, I think they're great. Yeah, I, I love them. I wish I I need to use it more just to get like better at it. But like leading up to the K and Q and these kingdom that I won, 
I specifically trained with cloak leading up to it. Cause I'm like, I, I know if I get to the finals and it's like a call and response type of thing. If I call cloak, there's only maybe like three other people in the kingdom that would be very excited about hearing this, this form being called. And I called cloak and it definitely worked out in my favor. My opponent was not super excited for it. <laughs> and I, and I took that pass and stuff. So like, oh, it was like thing is the, the coup de Jarnac, right? That whole story is, Oh, that guy's bad at buckling. Like, I'm yeah, gonna make him yeah. do it. Screw you, right? This is why, uh, if you ever read Tom Leone's chapter in, in The Service of Mars, part one, he talks about, yeah, you want to be the person who says you lie last when setting up this duel. Cause you know, the person accusing you of a thing gets to choose the time and place. You get to choose the weapons. I have a, a fun anecdote about cloak, which is, I, I typically think if people come up with a cloak that it's actually a liability to them, like most of the time, because most people don't spend a lot of time training with one. And some people who like, there's, there's the people, the people who have the like whippy do cloak thing from the nineties still going, which like, Hey, if that's you, like Donovan said, please bring it against me. I like to take your hand. Um, <laughs> Then there are people who are trying to figure out how to do it the right way and they stand there and they don't quite know how to employ the thing and end up being a little static. But one of my favorite examples of using a cloak, period cloak, really well was Master Kratia. I came out against him at one point and he's got this big ass cloak and he's like, I got your number. And I'm like, uh-uh. uh-uh. I was having a great day. CNT, so like my jam. And he's got this giant ass cloak and he unwraps it once and the cloak hangs down to the floor and he holds it out. And this is the day that I found out that Kratien is a belly dancer because he <laughs> completely isolated his upper body from his lower body. And I had no idea what the hell was going on. I couldn't find measure anymore. I was just, he beat me like a redheaded stepchild. It was terrible. <laughs> but it made me realize that there are actually some really clever ways that you can use a cloak to disguise your movement. So not just as like a martial tool in a, in a like more conventional sense, but like actually as a tool that can change the nature of the game dramatically. Yeah, and like, what are the reasons I like Cloak is I'm not very big to begin with. So like, it's very easy for me to hide behind a piece of fabric. And I'm just basically a floating head and maybe a sword point, depending on like what guard that I've taken at that point and stuff. It's great. It's obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. But like one of the things I tell people like who are new to cloak, like if they have to fight cloak, like, oh, I don't know what to do with this thing is just like the general advice that a lot of the masses give in which like everything you learned, you know how to do with single rapier, you can do with this thing in your offhand. You can do some other cool stuff, but like, if you don't know or to feel comfortable with it, just fight single. And like, you don't have to leap the cloak dangle all the way. You can just wrap it up a little bit more. And it's basically like a padded sleeve at that point. Kind of defeats a lot of the benefits of the cloak. But like, if you have to fight with cloak and you're uncomfortable, it's a easy way to get into that form and um, find some success, at least not trip over yourself <laughs> in the cloak. I've done that plenty of times. Cloak unravels a little bit on like the gym floor, take that advance, step on it and just like slide. <laughs> I'm like, well, I assume that I died at this point. <laughs> All right, so what else we got here for question? This one, uh, where is it, where is I'm it? Just, I'm shocked it took us until a cloak question for us to start getting really elitist about things. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like slowly ramping up some of these questions. Yeah, I'm letting some of the the beer that you know, booze everyone's been drinking kind of like hit the system before we get into the really spicy stuff. So we're getting into the really hot take sword. soon? Okay. So let's do that one. Which one? There's a question here about Street Sword. Yeah. Oh my God. Sword. Wait, what oh, was the Street Sword technique? Was that in the chat, the YouTube chat? Yeah, I looked up the YouTube for a second. Okay, I missed that question. What was it? Because I can't find it. Oh, no, that was, that was the whole question of what is your favorite street sword technique? I, was like, like, I don't know if you've... I, uh, that, I think my favorite one is where you throw the fedora at their face and then whip your katana out from under your trench coat. Glorious. Like, it's, you, it's a good opening. 
Do you need a, I think you need to do a quick context. This is an actual book that you can look up and buy called Street Swords. And it's like, it's the name of the book is exactly how you would expect the author of this book. To no way. Okay, I'm looking this. I'm looking okay. this up right now. What the, uh, what the crap? Have you not heard about this, Asha? Oh, no, no. Oh, my God. I'm so excited to see you have your first encounter with Street Sword. Yeah, so like Jesus. one of the, one of the, the HEMA schools did like a, reading like basically a zoom reading of, of of this with some annotations i believe and uh, you you found the listing then i see <laughs> what the hell am i looking at <laughs> you're looking at the 90s you're looking at the 1990s <laughs> this is like people? i watched way too much highlander and wrote a book yeah oh my god <laughs> uh, all right i think my eyes just threw up a little okay <laughs> uh, I have like read it. Can I throw my sword up in the air and then kick it into my opponent? That sounds like fun. We should do that one. That's a secret thrust, and you're not supposed to talk about. Oh, that. oh! Damn. I think I don't know if this is in the book, but I got one. You go up to the person with the katana and you start explaining to them why samurais would always lose fights against 16th century knights. That the long <laughs> sword is inherently superior to the katana, and you watch them die of apoplexy. <laughs> that's solid no just do it all as a metallurgy lecture though so they just don't oh, know yeah, what you're totally. talking about like you just go pig iron pig <laughs> iron over and over well, again so this is what folding metal actually does and why it's not made out of magic listen they're we an expert in like metallurgy I mean we got, we got elitist now right for real <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the bar for elitist when we're talking about street swords is like super fucking low, though. <laughs> like like, that's, like Gabby's first elitism in swords. Yeah, that's like, that's that's low hanging fruit in terms of elitism. Oh no, that's the apple that's been sitting there on the ground that's like <laughs> kind of distinguishable from dirt and there's like some worms in it. Is it like fermented oh, at this point? Some squirrel's gonna eat it and just get like shit faced off of it? It's like a crab apple. <laughs> All right, we've gone off the rails. Yeah, um, there's a there's actually a question that just got yelled about in the chat that I actually want I want to hear people's reactions to. All right, what is it? Uh, so the the quote Uber dagger, which is a, a blade length more than eighteen inches, is there a place for them? When do they come into their own? And is there a sweet spot in blade length, 18, 24, 30 inches, or whatever? Yep. I have strong opinions. Go, go for it. Let's hear it. <laughs> okay, so I have this thing I called my war dagger. It's a 24 inch blade. I typically only use it at Penzik in melee, but I have, uh, I'd say more recently, I've been a little out of the loop, but I have used it once in a while when I've been forced to play case. And actually, I kind of get it. I hate to like act to admit it because like, I am I am that elitist who thinks case is stupid most of the time. But like I can't remember what treatise. It's been a while since I, I was going through it, but there was there was somebody who advocated daggers that were like 22 to 24 inches in length. And like, this is pretty dope. I can do some great things with this. Like it's not long enough to get tangled up or any of that stupid crap you get with a typical case, but it's just long enough that I can reach out and just go and push away blades really nicely. So yeah, if you're gonna go with an Uber dagger, absolutely 24 inches. That's what I'm using. I think it's I think it's really nice. It can be a lot of fun. And it does give you a bit of an advantage. Uh, we do also see like some historical examples of these. So there's uh, it's often referred to as if you look up like 16th century, the duel of the century, there's this one duel in Bologna in the 1540s, where it's sword and short sword, essentially. Mm -hmm. So people are doing these kind of things in period. Uh, the, tr the, the key thing here is they're matching it to the other person uh, as opposed to just trying to outreach the person with my dagger and thus binding their sword and running forwards hoping they don't have really, really long arms. Yeah. Uh, an SCA classic. Well, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, having a dagger that's more than like 18 inches you do get into the point where you can get tangled up with your own weapons, you know, and, and where you can kind of misjudge the length of your dagger. It's, 
it's kind of the same way that having a really simple hilt versus having a hilt with like a cage on it when you're doing like CNT, where you'd think that it's going to be an advantage to have the more complex hilt, but there are definitely times where having a more like streamlined, more and more Spartan kind of hilt is going to you know, present you with an easy advantage of maneuverability. So there's give and take. It's not like it's inherently in a like superior thing. There are plenty of people who would, you know, kick my ass coming out with a sword and regular dagger that, you know, I gain zero advantage from having a longer blade in my offhand. Oh yeah. I was playing with my friend Julian a few years ago. He's a MOD who now lives in Calentir. They got his thing in Atlantia. Uh, and he was like, yeah, man, you need to use a shorter dagger. Like for what you're doing. Because I was like rolling out there with like an 18 inch, uh, like, what are they, sail guard trying to do Gigante. And it's like, it's getting caught, it's getting in your way, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I went out and I got a 12 inch dagger with curved keons. I'm like, I'll do that. Like, I'm like one on one. I'll also, if, as long as it's not a static line engagement, that's what I have with me in the melee field. Because that thing will just whip around my sword mm -hmm. and I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I've been playing around with a short dagger as well because the same idea, like, this 18-inch was, like, it's great for in terms of, like, super reach and stuff. But, yeah, trying to do any of the close guards and maneuvering my sword and dagger on each other, it just becomes much slower and bigger. So, like, I picked up a couple of, like, the Castile Economy daggers because they had, like, the 12-inch the and stuff, and I needed, like, some school owners. And, like, the, I like it. Like, it's just so fast. I can, like, get into position so much quicker. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the first time... So the first time I was playing with them, like, oh, it's, you know, it's six inch difference. If I go for like a dagger stab, because I still like doing those, like, it's not going to be that much of a difference. And I go for it. I totally came up like several inches short the first time I tried like <laughs> hitting someone with the actual dagger. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've really liked going something shorter, a little bit more persona appropriate, which is kind of, which, which I kind of, I kind of dig. Uh, yeah. Part of that came off of like a lot of the research Donovan did, like, over the summer and stuff on like dagger lengths and everything. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like if I'm if I'm fencing, I want like some something between like 10 to 14 inches. Mm -hmm. If I'm if I'm in a melee, sure, I'll take out some I'll take out a 24 inch blade in my offhand. But that in in my mind, that's not fencing, right? Like that's of course. that's <laughs> That's brutal. That's brutal murder on a melee field, right? Like it's it's a different it's a different game. But then again, I'm I'm also the human who are like look at someone like look at a, a 24 inch blade someone has and say like that's not a dagger, that's a short sword. Like you're fighting case. It's just short case. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's my war dagger. Damn it. I mean, call call it what you will. Like you can name your sword. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, speaking of taking stuff out of mail, I used to take case out all the time and eventually like, and then I stopped because I was doing it when I was commanding, but I realized that like, if I had case in my hand, I would always jump onto the front lines, which is not great if, uh, mm -hmm. if you're a commander. So eventually like, I will just bring out my dagger and that kind of stopped me from like jumping on the front lines. But I've also found that I really like run out to melee with just single, which is a lot of fun. Like even like sometimes like you might need an open hand for like depending on whatever the war point is and stuff. But even if it's just like I'm just going to be on the line going out there with single can be just a lot of fun. People just kind of look at you really confused, especially if you have like the white collar on and then you rolled out there in melee with single. There's a lot of like disconnect that's going on. Uh, and like, no man, it's cool. Them. I'm new. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite times I was fighting melee. This is actually. I dragged Asha into this main. I'll see if she remembers this story. Uh, so I was having shoulder problems that day. So I was fighting with my like shorter, lighter sword in my left hand. And I was like, oh, I'm like, it turns out I still have the same computer running all of these programs, even if like the tools are a little different. And knowing when and where to hit someone, even if my sword is three to shorter and it's my worst arm, it's like most of the work, like my kill ratio wasn't much different. Uh, no, the best part of that melee, though, was I was, like, kind of line commanding. Asha had, like, turned to the left and was fighting whoever. And then someone was, like, kitty corner this way, like, facing away from Asha, fighting this person on, like, my right. And I was like, Asha, stab that guy. Because, like, I just saw that this guy was just standing in her measure. And she's like, oh, and I just reached over and just hit him in the chest. 
Uh, and I ended up chatting with him later. He was like, oh, yeah. When you said that, uh, I knew that guy was me, and I couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. I think one of my favorite melee stories is in the was the woods battle uh, several years ago, and like these a few friends just come rolling up and like, oh, are you Master Remy? I'm like, yep. And like, oh, we've we've heard a lot. Of, John Drake and Miguel told us a lot of stories about you. I'm like, oh, cool. And then they just stop. They didn't. It's like it's just th- it's like three on one here, and they just stop and stare at me and just kind of like I'm like, this is I don't know what stories they told you, but I got to thank them later because apparently they're good stories if they're not gaining up on me on this three on one. <laughs> I think the, the, the only like melee story that's jumping to mind was was also a woods battle um, where I I really saw illustrated the difference between a tourney kingdom and a war kingdom. Um, because, you know, there was, it was a year when we just had ton, tons of crossovers from the armored uh, community in the woods. And it was great. Um, and you know, on the, the woods we've been using recently, uh, like there's the side that just has this like kind of sudden drop off. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sort of, I'm hanging out over there and two, like maybe might've been a knight and his squire or someone, but two like de- definitely armored crossovers are rolling up and there's a flag like 10 feet behind me that I'm protecting. So I kind of shrug and I like pop them both in the foot and move on with my life. Like my, my job here is done and there's like five other people who can sprint that I need to go deal with. And they got so angry, with, like legitimately pissed at me because from my perspective, I'm playing to the scenario. I have to guard this flag. You can't move anymore because there wasn't any knee walking. My job here is done. Like I, I have, I have protected the flag from you. You can like go kill yourselves and resurrect or, or not. Don't care. I have to deal with like John and Miguel who are like sprinting <laughs> through the woods, like sprightly elves or something like that are trying to get to my flag. And it, and it took me going to, um, my, my local armored combatant uh, interpreter and and uh... oh no he froze no I the best part oh no <laughs> just wait what the hell just happened I've been there in combat I'm like but, but I know but they're from Europe the east is a war kingdom you play to the scenario and I just kind of looked and was just like I don't understand but I accept the truth of what you said it was just a very weird moment to like in the middle of a melee, have these two people be super, super legitimately angry with me because I like walked away. It had How never dare. happened before. It was so strange. How dare you? I, I'm a monster. It's true. Well, that's not inaccurate. <laughs> Speaking of monsters, here's a question. Why or why not tip cuts? The harder to take, the better. <laughs> So basically, do you like tip cuts? It's discount cut and thrust. What? Huh? Discount cut and thrust? Yeah. Yeah. I was in a I was in a terminal that had tip cuts. And I was like, oh, I can just do my cut and thrust game. I just have to only do it with the tip. Yeah. I never even thought about it that way. Yeah, neither but have I. Now I always will. <laughs> I yeah, wow. I have I have opinions about tip cuts. Um And I think they are good, and I think you should take them. And and now I've had enough alcohol. I, I get to do the first rant. Here's why, right? So years and years ago, we're at like a, a kingdom, Kingdom Academy of the Rapier, and someone takes out this wooden stand and a pork shoulder and like saran wraps the pork shoulder to the the wooden stand and then drapes a couple of layers of linen over it. And then we start passing around a sharp. Uh, it wasn't a rapier. I think it was like an, uh, a trench sword. It was like a uh, yay long, like two and a half foot long blade, but it was rapier ish. Um, and it was, it wasn't razor sharp. It was useful sharp and people got to take shots at 
flesh with a bone in it and like a couple of layers of shirt on it and like a fake skin. Uh, and when someone did what most of us would consider a, a, a tip cut, uh, it laid the thing open like a good inch to two inches deep. And and wow, I mean, if nothing else, the calibration for the rest of the event was fantastic. People took people took really nice light shots at that point. <laughs> but right, because when you lunge through the meat and like you don't feel any resistance and you're sure I missed it and you try to lift the sword up and you can't because it's all the way through the meat, it's really creepy. But like that to me, that to my mind is more or less what's happening with a tip cut, right? Like we're dragging the you know, the, the bird blunt, like across someone's mask, right? Because I physically can't drag it across your face when it's like an inch into your body, right? Like I, I can't drag it like across you while having it penetrate. It, it's, it's not safe. And if I tried to do it that way, someone would get hurt, right? Like we're playing a game. So like to my mind, a tip cut isn't like, I'm just sort of like, doodling across your chest with, with, you know, a pointy thing, th there's some impact behind it. And like, you make allowances for the fact that I'm hitting you an inch or two farther away than I would have were this real in the same way that I don't blast into you for strength as though I were trying to like plant the guard of my sword into your chest and then tip you over, right? Like you make allowances for that sort of thing, but if it's delivered you know, more or less correctly, sure, it may not be lethal depending on where it hits you, but it will probably make you less inclined to want to continue the fight, right? Like I might not kill you with a tip cut if I, you know, if I whip it across your chest, but you're, you might want to call it a day at that point. Like <laughs> just like a lot of other, you know, a lot of our other, you know, attacks do, they may not be fatal, but like, by the rules we're playing under, you're done. So have a seat. So yeah, like tip cuts are good. Oh no. He'll come back. This is a great, great face for him to freeze on though. It's perfect. And, you know, he'll never know. Take now we're playing C T because I'm hitting you like an inch deeper into the play, bounce off your skull. Hooray. If I can I can add to that slightly. Um, I have I have not gotten the chance. I, I am kind of appalled at the thought of striking at, at meat. Um, I, however, have been meat in that I am one of the clumsiest people I've ever met. And I have managed to cut myself very deeply, very many times with blades that are not razor sharp. And those are like utility knives and things like that. And the thought that like a rapier, which is generally very sharp, wouldn't do serious damage if applied, you know, in the way of a tip cut. Just, just the notion of writing that off seems foolish to me. And it seems really against the spirit of the game we play. Yeah, like I know there's a story of, you know, two um, self-described idiots that decided, let's see what it's like to actually fight with sharp swords. And, and they did, uh, and one of them you know, took a shot, something like a good couple, couple of three inches deep in their thigh. Uh, and they didn't notice until, frankly, until their foot went squish. Um, they just didn't notice they were bleeding into their boot. And they didn't, they just did not notice. And that's cool. But on the other hand, the other person took a tiny little like half inch cut to their knee and like instantly stop the fight. <laughs> instantly stop the what? <laughs> like that, that was so horrifically painful. They were like, now nah, they need any stitches. Like they just got like bipped there. So like, you know, bodies are funny that way. Like, right. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's one of. Sorry. No, I, was just, I think we were about to say the same thing. So I'll let you go. <laughs> oh. I mean, that's, that's kind of one of the reasons why we can't play to the standard of incapacitating wounds, right? The, the standard is a wound that would draw blood because that's at least something we can measure semi-objectively and go, yeah, okay. You know, 
I could probably take a lot of abuse. Somebody half my size probably wouldn't be able to handle and that'd be a really crap measurement for us to play by. And then adrenaline is stupid and people mm -hmm. like what's the, you know, the, the studies that have been done where people just don't notice. The... <laughs> <laughs> They've been stabbed half a dozen times until they fall away, like, let alone where there's like a tournament or something on the line. That's... <laughs> Sorry, you like froze for like five seconds there. And it was, it was, then, it was amusing. Yeah. <laughs> and then went in fast forward to get caught up to real time. Yeah, so we had like fast, fast Donovan the voice. Every time you get too spicy, it just cuts out for you. It does. Zoom is like anti Donovan spice yeah. at this point. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else we got for questions out here? Uh, bu -bu -bu. Oh, his, this is a fun one. This might get some interesting answers. What are your thoughts on cut and thrust specifically? Like what weapons from a culture outside of Europe, European history, would you like to see more of? So i so like, we have a local fencer, uh, Countess Meggy, who's been doing a lot of like Middle Eastern and Indian weapon studies and stuff and like curved saber. Like, I don't know the official terms and stuff. So I apologize. Uh, but like curved sabers, scimitars, that kind of stuff. And the bucklers versus the bucklers. It's really fun to like watch her kind of, there's not a lot, she doesn't have a ton of actual manuals to like work off of. It's a lot of like piecing stuff together, but it's really cool to like have to been watching her kind of put that together over the past several years and take that out into a rapier list and try to fight this form. That's our rules are really made for like rapier and actually trying to like get this more hack and slash weapon to kind of, to kind of work with it. So I'd love to, to see more of that, especially like in CNT, because I think that would do really well because that's what it's kind of just made more for, I think. Yeah, I know one of our royals, this guy, Count Seto, wonderful dude, like the nicest yes. dude. Uh, can also just throw you across the room if he wants. Uh, you have to ask him for it. He'll be happy to do it. Uh, super great dude, anyhow. So he's been doing some research into the Chotel, uh, which is like a, I believe, North African sword. I don't know a ton about it. Most of them are like, hey, Seto, you're the dude for this thing, right? Uh, but it's this like really curved weapon. Uh, I fought against one once and they like reached around my guard, caught me with the false edge and like hamstrung me. And I was like, oh, that's a new sensation. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not used to that thing. Uh, so yeah, I think that would be really fun. Uh, and like, we definitely, have even right from a European context, like Naples isn't that far from like North Africa. Like in fact, it's closer there, like to there than it is to England. Uh, so I think our lens of like, ah, there's Europe is like a largely a post period notion. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I'd be super, right, like the easy one is like, Cool, there's katanas, which are like, yeah, we should do that. People should do that. Happy for them. Uh, but I think it'd be like even more fun to like, get into the weeds there. Uh, one of the things I've found recently is like playing with side sword and like especially anything where the blade is under like 36 inches and it goes in one hand. I can like find something to match me fairly well from any fighting culture. Uh, whereas like rapier is this weird specific highly specialized <laughs> thing uh, and even long swords are like kind of like somewhat more niche but like oh okay like I can find someone who's done like uh, Japanese swordsmanship or people coming from stick fighting or foam fighting in other groups and like line up with a side sword under cut and thrust rules and be like, oh, okay, cool. Like, we're, we can like speak uh, in the non SCA sense, peer to peer. Right. Because I like, I'm no longer interested in being like, I will best you with technology. Like, if you are bringing I 33 out in the cut and thrust tournament, I'm not picking up my rapier. That's boring. Uh, like, I don't want to buy my way out of a fight, essentially. So, yeah, yeah sure tells. Look them up. A whole, a whole other thread in this too, which is while well, you know the notion of things that are outside of Europe, you know, frankly, most of us don't really know much about those weapons. Uh, you know, there, there, there isn't a lot of scholarship, and that's not for for a lack of interest. There just isn't a lot of scholarship 
um, to be had. There's, I guess, an equal lack of scholarship, but a huge diversity of weapons and, and time periods that we don't really explore very much that are actually in Europe. That things like, well, CNT specifically opens up a, a, a great way to explore. Like, I'd, I'd love to see more people look into Bronze Age Celt weaponry or even like Roman weaponry or anything that's pre, you know, I'd say 14th century or earlier, uh, uh, just to be able to explore from like a, a living anthropological standpoint, some of these martial arts where all we really have to go on because there, there are no manuals, all we have to go on are the you know, technology and some you know, few accounts. Yeah, I Armor is worn Bronze Age tournament. Fuck yes. Hell yeah. Let's, Let's do this. <laughs> um, Bring it. Like the beetle what? outfits you see like the Middle East, but like, oh, they're bonkers. I love them. I, I think for what it's worth, I think there's a fair amount of scholarship that's happening with a lot of, um, you know, the, the various weapons and styles that aren't, you know, European or have manuals, but I don't think there's been a lot written about them and, or, or if there has been, it's not in English. So, right. Yeah, like, and you froze, I mean, you froze or I froze. So if you mentioned this, I missed it and I apologize. Um, but yeah, like I, I know that, oh God, I'm blanking on his name. There's a, a gentleman who's been doing just tons and tons of work into various African weapons. And it's not like they have written, Demon you know, it's not like he's working from a written manual. Uh, Damon Smith is his Yes, name. thank you. That's yeah. the gentleman I'm thinking of. So yeah. is he working from like a, a, a like living anthropology standpoint? Like is he actually like going through and working through the, the weapons, like how would one use this and that kind of thing? That this my, sounds fascinating to me. My understanding, and I, I could be very wrong, is that he's working, as you said, he's working through them from a, a that anthropological standpoint and also is sort of trying to like, okay, so like this is what, you know, these folks did with a shield and a spear and that's similar but like okay so we can't do this and we can't do most of that because they're shaped differently enough so what would work instead and he just sort of right. goes from there um is my understanding but Very but cool. he's doing some fantastic work but no published book so it's harder for a lot of folks who can't get to a seminar to really um pick up on it but it's certainly happening it's certainly out there and cnt is fantastic for getting to just dive into it yeah yeah for sure uh here's a good question that came from the youtubes and i it kind of harps back to some of the early conversation uh one viewer asks i like case quite a bit but it seems to suffer from disdain among the more elite bookish rapier folks please explain why who wants to feel that one first or I can. Uh, so I'll take it. Sure, go for it. So I'm an elitist bookish rapier fighter. I'll take that. Title. <laughs> uh, I've been like quoting books left and right. Uh, yeah. So I like I don't love doing case myself. Uh, that said, I like I'll often hear at a tournament like, ah, oh, well that guy just walked out with a big shield. That's why he won. Or like, ah, oh, she's just fighting case. Or Asha's just tall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think those are all dumb excuses and you can do better. Uh, like, bring whatever, you know, within this rule set, uh, bring whatever you want. Like, I, I'm a big fan of confining rule sets. Uh, I know at Penzik, for instance, Jesco runs some conquest tournaments of like, your sword can only be this long and can't have a complex hilt. Great, we should do those things. Uh, right, again, like, I don't want to do right here versus I-33. Uh, but yeah, like, if... Like, I think case is fine. Uh, we don't have, it's not in as many manuals, uh, but it is in a few. If you want late period stuff more for a rapier, you want to look at Dociolini. Uh, most of the case material we see is for shorter swords, right? For side sword kind of stuff. Like, Manchulino has a great section on it. Uh, I think the stigma comes from just like with a bar of phrase from Asha again, attribute fencing, right? Winning because you're fast or tall or whatever. Uh, if you walk out with more points, like more points like to stab people with, early on in your career, you will happen into more victories because if your opponent messes up, they will just run into a sword. Uh, and I think people get annoyed at that early on and then carry it 
late, like into their career later. But at this point, like I've been doing this for 14 years, like point whatever you want at me. Not gonna change your game. Yeah, uh, I'll use a little more footwork. If there's more swords. That's really it. Yeah, like it's, it is an advantage, broad, broadly speaking, right? Like, yes, you can say things like, sure, you know, but you can tangle up both of the points and this, that, and the other thing. Sure, fine. But, you know, I, I think it is a reasonable, if broad statement to say, someone rolling out with case of 45s against me when I'm taking out like a single 39 has an advantage, just like if they were taller or faster or had more endurance or whatever. Um, you know, and I, I think that a, it, a lot of that disdain came from people getting very frustrated when either they lost to them a lot and needed to make themselves feel better, right? Like your ego's a thing. And if you can point to someone and say, oh, well, he only won because he fought case. You feel, you feel better, like, you know, it hurts less. And that's understandable. You know, just like, oh, well, that person's like six foot six and, you know, has the, you know, twitch reflexes of a mongoose. Like, I can't beat that. But like, okay. Um, but like, you. you know, to a degree, you get the point of like, well, what are you going to do about it? Like, and, and it is frustrating, like, and it is frustrating, right? Like, let's be super real. It is, you know, it, it sucks to like be trying to work really hard at like what you think of as a, super period game and then someone rolls out with like case of 50s and it's just like well shit i guess i guess we'll go practice against this then like yeah and um, i think part of this comes down to like what people like values uh, like people's values in fencing like there are some folks that really want to do re like reconstruct the manuals and stuff so their value is more like try to do proper historical technique and there's also values of like, I just want to get this victory because I want to get the win. I want to win the tournament and the prize. So there's more of a value shifted down more like results versus like the journey for a lack of a better phrase and stuff. And yeah. I think sometimes th that's two different, like those things collide very easily. I think sometimes. Yeah, and, and, and the problem is I think it is very easy to try and just to be discussing this and come off sounding like you're being disdainful of like the people who fight case right like no nah, if you want to fight case fight case like that's cool like so, some of my favorite people fight case right <laughs> like but like it's true they do and they're in like they're but they're also real freaking good at it because like they're they pick it up and they're like this is what i want to do and they go out and, and kick ass at it like and they're clearly not using it just because like well but what if I pick up more and longer swords? What if I go up with like Case of Madu? That's that's four points out there. Do it. Fucking Can I do it. Pause it something quick. I gotta jump out of here, unfortunately. Oh, no. In just a minute. Yeah, I got a date. Um, <laughs> I mean, solid. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, but just like a, a quick thing here, a, a thought on this subject about why uh, Salita snobs. Uh, disdain case and i think part of it isn't that we disdain case it's that we value effort and scholarship so much not even necessarily scholarship in the sense of crack open a manual and learn from a manual because i mean frankly a lot of us learn more from other people than we ever do from text but we value the effort of learning something and workshopping it and making it good and a lot of people i like to say around the two-year mark of fencing get they hit a wall and they're not getting anywhere. And they go, I know, I'm going to take pick up case. And then they get this next little boost because now they do have those extra points and they just rely on it. And they never actually end up putting in the effort and getting good. They just become sewing machines and they, they, they use it as a crutch and it stifles them. And when we see that, like me personally, I can say when I see that, I just get a little sad, like, man, here you are out here, like you're putting in the effort of coming out and fencing, but you could be so much better than you are because you are relying on this crutch that's honestly not carrying you as far as you think it is. So it's not really disdain. It's like disappointment, I guess. I don't know. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna like drop that and you're like, you know, mic drop and head out. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think that's very internet of you and I applaud it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me on. I had a great time and I hope we get to do this again soon. Hell yeah. It's great seeing you in person and not just a photo on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> right back at you. <laughs> All right. So another question. Um, this one's going to be great. This is going to be the, some hot takes here. Can you win fights with period techniques? I'll let Donovan take that one. <laughs> Absolutely not. Period technique is useless and you will never find success with it. Books are dumb and reading is stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely never have the urge to quote a passage after I hit someone with a thing. That's not an experience I've ever had in my life. I definitely I know. Having a fight and then pulling out a book and pointing at the picture in the book and saying that's what happened is not an experience that I love to pieces. I've definitely not done in blog posts just like that. By, Look the, at this. by the book tournaments are also bad. Yes, yes. The letters are fighting each other about then no one wins. <laughs> Uh, I think the the actual lesson for if you want to be serious for a second to take away here, uh, if you do things the proper way, to use you know the elitist phrasing, uh, if you do it by the book, you will have a longer on ramp to being good. Uh, right, like doing a proper lunge where your arm goes and then your body goes and then your foot goes is very against human nature. It will take you a long time to do right. And then you're going to spend years realizing you did it wrong and then fix it. And then you're going to come back to it in about a year and then go, crap, I did it wrong again. Then you're going to change that. Uh, so it's a longer on ramp. So you will likely not find early success trying to do it like the book. That said, it's so like my maestro, for instance, is. I'm sure he's watching. I'm going to get this wrong. He's going to tell me later. I think he's 69. He absolutely, he absolutely he's 100% is. He's 100% watching. So watch this. <laughs> uh, so he's like 69 years old. And last time, right, so he has 41 years on me uh, of life and probably about that much of fighting, if not more. So I'm like, he, we, he was going at least 50-50 with me, if not better, last time we fought back in November. Right, I wanna give people 50, 60 year trajectories in their fencing career. And I think one of the greatest things that doing it by the book gives us is it keeps your joints happy and lets you keep doing it. Right, like the, the model we see a lot in Olympic fencing, and if this is your goal, great, do it. Uh, I'm not disparaging people who do things that meet their own goals. Uh, but it's go get a gold medal by 32, stop competing. Uh, I am not interested in those kind of sports. Uh, I'm interested in like old person ways of fighting because uh, I want to keep doing this when I'm Donovan's age. Uh, Watch it. <laughs> right, and I'd like to be able to do it when I'm Terry's age. So like it'll yeah. help it's kind of rolling up. So yeah, it'll take you longer to get on board and to get good. Uh, I'm sure there's some people who will just pick it up instantly, but like most of the time, not just going fast, hitting hard will take you longer. Uh, and especially if you don't have, like I am blessed to have a lot of resources around me to pull from. Like I stumbled into a very book heavy practice. Uh, so it's going to take even longer if you are out on your own uh, or if you're the only person in your practice who's reading a book. That said, uh, I don't think that everyone has to read out of books to be good at swords. Yeah, I, I agree. Just kind of like add on to that. Um, like for me, when I first started fencing in the SE, I came from a foil background. So I was trying to do foil with a rapier. And like the only reason I got any kind of victories is because I was like 130 pounds. I was five, six, I'm tiny, and I was fast. So not a lot of target, very quick. And that got me like far. I, I would could win some like beginner tournaments because I was faster than everyone else and stuff like that. Um, but eventually like, I hit a wall against the really good fencers in, in the area because my game was I'm fast. 
And I realized I, for me anyways, I realized if I want to get better at this, I need to figure out how this tool, this weapon actually works. And that's how I started like diving down the Italian rapier path and, and doing drills with, with Donovan and stuff like that. But yeah, I agree. Like you probably, it's probably like a slower on-ramp to success if you, but I feel like you, when you do start find success, it, it stays. You're not going to have as much of those up and downs. And even if you do have some up and downs, at least you can figure out what went wrong. Like one of the biggest things I conversations I'll have with people is they just don't know what happened in a fight. And I think part of that is that they don't have a language for dissecting what happened. But if you're studying a book and you have a system, you can kind of figure out what, like, what line did you get hit on? What action did they do to hit you other than, well, yep, you hit me in the face. It's just a, such a generic way of describing how you lost a fight. But you can actually explain like, well, I tried finding here on the inside. You disengage and you hit me in Primo on the outside line in Contra Tempo. Like you can actually dissect it and then you can figure out if you're getting hit a lot of the same ways and stuff. So I think in the long run, um, it can be really helpful um, to have like a system, even if you don't even open up a book, if you just even study with someone that teaches you the system, I think that's a, a huge help in terms of um, finding like long-term success. And also like you were saying, like long-term health of, of joints and stuff and not like trying to blow out <laughs> your knees by doing the giant ass Olympic lunges and, and stuff like that, so. Yeah, I think to build off of that point, uh, on top of the like joint health, the other aspect is you walk into a community of people you can ask questions of, right? I, you know, if I am stuck on how to do this plate out of Gigante, I have people from across the country, from across the continent. Uh, I don't know a ton of folks in the European scene, but I'm sure there's some folks there who can answer my questions. And be like, hey, how do I do this right? Like when I'm trying to find and gain, they're like escaping my sword. Oh, I'm doing hilt first. That is the, right. And like there's a, a larger framework I can just plug into and I can understand, uh, understand things at a systematic level instead of having to solve each problem as it comes. Yeah, I was, I, I mean, my so my internet glitched again, which is my theme for tonight. Um, but, but what Remy said about um, having the shared language to, you know, figure out what happened and, and then to, to Arik's point, um, having a shared language means that I can, we can skip past the whole, what do you mean for this? And what do you mean for that? Like, what do you mean when you say this bit? And, and he and I can just get to, okay, so like I extended in fourth and I did this cavazione and I turned it to second. We have a shared framework to, to get to the meat of the problem. Um, but I, th I think the, the big benefit to working from a system is, is like you said. Oh, spicy take right there. <laughs> What's the benefit? I don't know what I'm getting from all you this. You can approach like... things from a safe. Oh, God. <laughs> um, wow. I can play the video games online and it's never a problem. I want to talk about swords and everything just goes to shit. <laughs> What's the benefit of learning from a period system, Donovan? We don't know. He freezes again as he's about to explain. Oh my God. <laughs> Look, everyone freezes at the same time. Oh man, we wouldn't. So right, but like, oh my god. Okay, I'm gonna disconnect and then jump back. Yeah, you're That's just damn problem. Yeah, let's see that. Yeah. Uh, we Wait, would not. What are your spicy Fabris hot takes while it's gone? My spicy Fabris. I don't know if I have any spicy Fabris hot takes. Oh, sorry, no, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, there goes that. So. So going back to like, you were talking about being able to like message people all over across the country and potentially the globe for like feedback and yeah. input and advice and stuff. That's like one of, one of the few maybe silver linings of the pandemic is that it really kind of exploded online learning and teaching oh, sure. and stuff. And yeah. like, I've gotten to know you better over the last couple of years than like the six years I knew you before, because right. we would do online classes together. We do like these little chats like this and stuff and like being able to i've been you know jumping into some of like guy windsor's like monthly coach sure. chats and stuff or doing stuff with david biggs i know he's out in the chat like it's been really cool in terms of 
I get to work with these people who are really knowledgeable in their areas from all over the place and stuff. Oh so. yeah. I've been working with people all the way from like Vancouver, Canada to Brazil. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah great. Let's see what these guys are. Uh, I also think getting uh, to pivot a bit, uh, I think it's important to bring in, even looking at the same book, to bring in diverse opinions as to how that will be applied, right? both in like the cultural sense, uh, but also in the physical sense, right? You know, at this point, we are now a bunch of like cis dudes all in a room. Uh, you know, hips are built in this fashion. And then I'm working with someone who's hips built in a different fashion and be like, hey, I don't want you to ditch this book. I think the book still has value for you. But let's see how this applies over here. Yeah, that actually goes into a question that was asked out in the chat of, do you think different historical styles fit better for people's physicality or are all the styles masters for everyone? Uh, I think Rada wants you to burn as many calories as possible. <laughs> um, I, so, so as one of the, the local Fabris goons, um, no, not every historical style is necessarily going to be perfect for everyone if you're trying to replicate the manual, right? Like, you know, and granted, Fabris says, man, if you can't do this, do the best you can and then just go stretch a lot, but pay attention to what you're doing and understand the benefits to your guard. So he's not expecting you to fold yourself in half out of the gate. But like, depending on your back or on your hips, you just might not be able to do it. You just might not be able to, to even rep, like try to replicate his guard. And that's fine. Like that doesn't mean you can't take things away from the system, but it, if you're trying to like look like the plates, it's, it's not gonna work super well for you. Um, but there you know, are buckets of historical systems which are super great and they will serve you just as well. Yeah, I think there's definitely certain systems that are less physically accessible than other systems. Yeah. Right, Fabris is at the high end of the inaccessibility spectrum. Uh, right, I know people who can like do that, do Fabris who have physical issues, but like, you know, someone has a bad back and they walk into class day one, they're like, no, nah, I'm not doing that one. Uh, I think one of the nice things if, yeah, This is my favorite. Uh, Latouche. Don't do that. Yeah, oh, Latouche. God, my so my favorite part about, sorry, I, I interrupted Arik, I'll throw it back to you, but like my favorite part of like Latouche here is that like in the beginning of his book, he's like, I like I'm telling you for real Z, this me and my students can do this. And if you don't believe us, we'll come down there and fight you. Oh, <laughs> he basically is like, you. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think the other nice thing that we get, like if your thing is, hi, I would like to do a by the book system to hit people in the face with sword. Great. Uh, even with any given tool, there's multiple correct answers. Uh, that doesn't mean that all answers are correct. Right, like sword should go before your foot is like a rule. Uh, but right, we have a really big group of span or big, we have like a, a very large proportion of Spanish fencers in my practice. Uh, right, they do great against the Italian rapierists. Right, it's they're you know it's contemporary with them. Pacheco's writing in the 1590s, I believe. I know Ernesto's in the chat. I'm sure he'll correct me. Uh, but it's, you know, a few years off from Gigante and Fabris. Uh, and then, you know, they go all the way up to Rada, which is like 1700. Uh, so there's more than, if you want to do a thing in the same decade as someone else, there's more than one thing you can do. You might actually have the teacher for that next to you, which like is an obstacle. And I understand that I've been there, but like, if you will want to work with me, right, I will find a book that will suit your body that we can do something with. Yeah, and like my, so like this, also my experience is mostly just reading like Italian and, and French text. So like, I can't like speak for like uh, any other like systems and stuff, but like, you know, like Donovan was saying, I think if you try to like perfectly replicate some of the, the plates and stuff, like not many people are built like the plates um so like that's that's a problem and, and stuff i think like you can take a lot of the systematic stuff that's in there like the basic like blade mechanics is gonna still cross over regardless of 
you know, how your shoulders or, or hips or, or legs and stuff is built and everything like that. So I think a lot of good, at least good, good systems, I, I think, can like easily be adjusted to different people's body types and athleticism and like uh, physical abilities and, and disabilities and stuff like that. It just might take a little bit more work and it helps to have like, I think, a, like a good coach or someone that's kind of like that really knows the material well or like a trainer that really knows how body moves and stuff and kind of like help figure out to, to match things and stuff. Cause I have, I have some students that like, they, they have bad knees and they don't, they can't lunge very often or they just will be in a lot of discomfort for like the next several days. So they do a ton of stuff on the pass. And like, even though like a lot of the Italian plates show people tacking all oh, the lunges, you can totally do that stuff with, with passing steps and passing lunges and find perfectly good success if like everything else is good, like you got the line closed off and just good blade mechanics and stuff. So I definitely yeah, think uh, there's a lot of wiggle room yeah, when it comes to that. I mean, especially since there are long... <laughs> uh, lots of people that will never be able to quote unquote look like cool, cool. Um, every, like, how many people in like Cap like Capoferro and Giganti and Fabris, like everyone who's illustrated is presumably like a random cis dude. Yep. So, you know, I, I think it's worth looking at a lot of the, the initial plates, you know, a little more uh, like initially looking at them critically to figure out how they can be, you know, what how much like how much variability there is in them before like the body structure doesn't suit what the play is doing anymore and the like, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think like the least spicy hot take on this one is they're all right-handed. Sure. Occasionally they'll reference that lefties exist unless they're in Spain. Uh, but if you're a lefty, it's going to take you a little bit longer to stare at this picture and mirror it. We're going to go, hey, right, we talked about this earlier. When I line up, they're on the other side. Okay, there's a part in the book where I have to go do that, but it might not be at the beginning of the book because we didn't start on the outside because they're assuming righty versus righty. Yeah. So you're going to change a few things. But like, you know, I don't think Terry is any less Trigante for being a lefty. I mean, like, I could not think of a single person who would have that opinion. That would be a weird opinion. If you do, I'm sure he'll be happy to fight you. <laughs> Can we just say that just to get in line to fight him, though? <laughs> That's between you and him. Sure. <laughs> so, like, uh, one thing I do like, so Guy Windsor basically ha he has, like, all these workbooks, and he has it for righty, but he also translated it also for lefty and stuff. So if you're interested in Italian rapier, specifically, like, Capoferro, look up, like, Guy Windsor stuff. He's put a lot of work on trying to translate stuff to uh, work for a lefty and like make it make sense and not like have to do a lot of translating from righty to lefty and stuff. Um, let's see. Oh man, uh, what else do we got on here? Here's a, here's a melee question. Are there any melee scenarios that you've never tried but would like to given the opportunity? I'll start with this one. I would love, I don't know how we would do it without it being stupid or a shit show, but I would love to do pike and shot in like rapier. I would love like pike, like pikes and cannons and shot. Like, I don't know how you do the rubber band gun without rubber band guns that like don't hit hard. Like I've hit people, blasted people in the face with those things and they just like not realize they've been hit in the face and stuff. Um, but like as someone who, is a fan of like military history from that part. That would be fun, but I don't know how we would do it without it devolving very quickly. I mean, I armored combat nine foot spears. Like, uh, I think one of the fun things would be to have multiple victory conditions. So right now we have a bunch of like scenarios that exist separately from each other like you can kill everybody or you can get the MacGuffin or you can pull these flags are pretty much the breakdown at this point uh, and I think it'd be interesting I haven't explored this one at all uh, 
but to go, hey, cool, you can win in one of two ways in this scenario, right? Like these are both, right? Like uh, hold the flag, but three lives, right? So either, you know, I can win on time by running to the flags and just standing there, or I just murdered all your people. What, what, what flags, those don't matter. So I think like being able to choose between multiple paths to victory would be interesting and wouldn't require us to mess with armor rules or blow calling or anything like that. Yeah, I was, I did a, it was like a three fencer melee tournament event thing in which like everyone basically they pulled out of a hat an objective so you have like 10 teams out there of three fences and they each had their own objective. So they're trying to like stop other people's objectives while achieving their own, which was kind of, which kind of, which was kind of fun. So something like that might be kind of interesting. I like, honestly, like at Penzik, not like you just still, maybe still the two teams and stuff, but yeah, I like the idea of the mid and the East maybe don't have the same objective. They have slightly different things. So now you got to try to achieve yours and like stop the other one, but you might not know what they, they have to do either. That could be kind of interesting. Yeah, I know we see some of this uh, in like period ways of thinking about strategy. There's like a Viking, not I want to, I don't want to say precursor to chess because I can't prove that it goes in a straight line at all. I don't know about the history of either one, but there's like a Viking chess-like board game. Uh, don't remember the name where it's the two sides have different ways of winning, uh, and it's like clear that one side is a little easier way of doing. But that doesn't mean that it always happens that way. So yeah, creating like intentionally unequal scenarios and then flipping it would be fun. And not yeah. just like I start up it. <laughs> I'm on defense, you're on offense. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> I'm I'm outside the fort, you're inside the fort. <laughs> yeah, asymmetric uh asymmetric competitions are fun. Um, and as long as you, like you said, you flip them then yeah, like you don't need to worry about making sure they're balanced. Like, you know, board game designers lose their minds trying to balance two asymmetric sides. But like, if you're just going to flip sides anyway, who cares? Go to town. All right. Here's a, this, this should get some fun answers. What is the worst fencing advice you've ever gotten? Ooh. So I know what mine is. Should I start? I, I think, oh no, I think mine was literally just books are, you know, this historical crap is stupid and you will never find success with it. Yeah. Just, How's that feel? Just, just go Six use that base techniques with a, with, with a rapier. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, maybe one day you will amount to something. You might actually win a big tournament or any tournament or any I, fights one day. I dare to dream. I don't know. Don't hit people in the hands might be up there. <laughs> like, nah, it's fine. I'll take them. Uh, Remy, your audio cut out. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Hooray! Uh, I was fussing with the mic. Thing. Yeah, you caught my problems. Yeah! Uh, so I think the, the worst advice I ever got, and it seems like good advice on the surface, but really isn't, is do something different. You keep throwing the same shot, which sounds like great advice, right? Do something different. The problem was I didn't fucking know what something different was. This was back when, like, before I was doing anything kind of historical. And so my, my attacks all were the same because I didn't have any techniques or basic framework for what something different would be. So that was awful. It's like, sure, I would love to do something. Do and it'd be great. It would have been fine if said person like gave me some options and like actually pulled me aside. Like, hey, let's work on three other ways you can attack somebody. But it was literally like, you need to do something different. <laughs> and they like just like moonwalked off the list. I'm like, well, that was definitely the least useful advice I have ever gotten. So if you got to give someone advice and be like, hey, do something different, you might want to have some examples for them, assuming they've consented to your feedback in the first place. That's my mini rant. It's not as good as Donovan's rants. <laughs> we can tell because my webcam did not freeze on me. 
Uh, let's see what else we got here. Da, 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 da. Uh, I know like this is pretty standard at this point, but bad melee advice is you can only bring case or a rotella to be successful. That's just bunk. Yep. Bring whatever you're good at. Yeah, I've done plenty of melees in which I've gotten a shit ton of kills just fighting single. Yeah. Like, I bring Rotellos to static line engagements because I have to stand there and just you know helps me block a thing out. But if you make me fight you one-on-one -on -one with Rotella, anyhow, so if anyone here wants to make me lose a duel, make me fight you through Rotella. Uh <laughs> sufficient time with them, and I will probably die. Noted. Next next by the book tourney. <laughs> Gonna be all Rotella all the time. Uh, we had there was one summer at Penzik where we had like five people in a row with the iron ring who just kept going, Oh, what is that person bad at? I will make them fight it. And I'm like, it worked every time. Yeah, I mean, forcing someone to fight something they're not great at is yeah, not a bad tactic. So um Let's talk about spears. How excited are we? Are we not about spears in the SEA? Spears are great. I'd imagine like we're not going to have a ton of like controversial hot. At least uh, I feel like we're all on probably the same boat. So for us, this is not hot takes. But I'm sure yeah, for some people, these might fun. be hot takes. I don't think they're like the single greatest thing. Uh, I think we will have to like chain like put asterisks on our tournament descriptions to be like this is a sword tournament uh because there's been a couple instances i've heard of but i haven't seen in person of like person brings nine foot spear to 42 inch rapier tournament wins so i, mean, I don't want yeah. like, uh, what it's worth you can just at least the way the rules are written you can look at someone and say i don't want to fight that spear and they have to go pick up something different yeah. Now, there's, granted, there's social pressure there, but the option does exist. I don't want to put the onus on the fighter. Granted. Right. Especially, you know, if you're what, like Johnny New Shoes and the mod points a spear at you, I don't think the person pointing the spear is mod. I'm just like throwing this out there. Or like the king, right? Right. Anyone of high rank does this thing, you're going to be like, ah. Uh, uh, so, like, if the Marshall in charge just says no spears in tournament. That solves that problem like across the board. So I'd prefer it, you know, like write your tournaments more accurately. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I think they're fun. I'm interested to see how they affect larger melees, whether they're a like sometimes thing or whether it just becomes the like I can shot squares. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. Uh, I don't own a car, so like I don't own a spear because I can't fit it in <laughs> the bag I take on the subway. Listen, next time there's a purple war, I will I will lend you one of my spears. We can be oh, spear great. bros. Cool. We can be spear bros out there. We'll get the thieves of hearts and the handsome calibers to roll out of one giant spear block. I'm gonna do it. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, no, not I'm, I'm down for that. Them to do it, but I'll do it. <laughs> and just spear and rotella block. Yeah. Ooh, that sounds good. I'm excited for Spears. Like, I think it's, it's, I like it because it just opens up a whole new, like, realm of historical martial arts that we can study yeah. and, like, see where, like, how that crosses over with, with stuff that you might have learned with long swords and vice versa. Like, one of my favorite things to do, like, I am just for, like, context, I fuck around with long sword. I have not really studied it and stuff, but I'll take, like, when I got my spear, I'm like, I'm going to do some long swords bullshit. With the spear and like it works great and it's like a lot of fun to like watch see find yeah. those overlaps and all that kind of stuff and yeah i'd say out of all of the poems we see in the books spears are the least exciting for me just as like there's the least amount of things yeah uh like partisans exciting there's a whole chapter in the animal bolognese of uh armored polax fighting that chapter is mean <laughs> uh like, take your butt spike, shove it into their foot. Great. Once, like, events and stuff happens more regularly in the East, I need to write up, I want to write up the experiment for, like, double-ended spear, 
because I guess apparently this is, this is the thing for the French, which like it's a they basically kind of use like a montante, so it's really like an area effect weapon. But it's like it's your spear, and you got like two spearheads on on either side. Um, that like honestly like couldn't really do the way it's meant for in the SCA, but just being able to like have a secondary like attacking point on 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 the opposite side could be kind of fun. Yeah, at I least for me. Spear fighting recently in a not SCA context. Uh, so they were able to use hardwood, I don't remember which one, uh, as opposed to rattan. And that was a lot more fun because it went straight forwards. Yep. My my partisans, base, you can almost do a flick shot with them because the rattan is skinless, so it's super wobbly. And like that partisan head that I have anyways is very soft. So like you could definitely get a, a flick shot and just like bane around somebody's parry hit them in the arm, head, face, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't throw those shots because I, I like to try to use the weapon in a little more, like, correct historical fashion. Assume that, like, it's steel and hardwood and not this floppy soft wood and rubber and stuff. But you could definitely do it. <laughs> All right. I, th- I mean, another thing, like, and I've had this conversation uh, with, with my wife, Kate, that's... W- that, and I think it's a really good point in terms of spears is for a lot of us, we're all kind of starting off with it roughly at the same time. So it's not like a new fencer coming in fighting someone who has like 40 years of experience. A lot of us, we've only picked up spears the last couple of years. So I think that's kind of cool in terms of a lot. There's a lot more even in the ground of like an even playing field, at least in some regards, in terms of experience levels. I'll say this, that's not completely true because you have crossovers that have done spear work, even if it's different slightly different rule sets and stuff like that but i think that was kind of a an interesting thought and take on it let's see what else any questions here in the chat i don't think any good in the chat um and arc has run on off let's see we'll start off with this one so this is we're going we're kind of jumping to like pop culture (laughs) there he is jumping to pop culture for a second uh but when you watch a sword fight on television what is your immediate reaction? Is it oh no no or huh? Interesting. Who wants to take? I'm not sure if Donovan's frozen or if he's just very. Oh, now he's back. I think he just froze. <laughs> um, anyone want to jump on that one, or should I start on that one? Uh, yeah, I'm not the most optimistic. There was a great video a while ago. Uh, there's a YouTube channel. They stopped putting stuff out called Every Frame of Painting that did a breakdown of uh, Jackie Chan as like an overview and comparing what he does to Western action movies. Uh, and one of the great points they made was that in a lot, right, again, p- painting in broad strokes, uh, in a lot of Chinese and Hong Kong action movies, what they do is they take fighters and then they teach them a little bit of acting. Whereas in American movies, they take actors and teach them a little bit of fighting. All right, so if I'm going to watch, and like there's, you know, there's there's exceptions, uh, right? Like Keanu Reeves, for instance, like is, you know, he's Canadian, but like, okay. Like, I don't think he's the world's greatest like character actor. Dude does great stunts. Really good at fighting. Anyhow, uh, so if it's a right, if it's a John Wick level movie of like the point of this is to hit people a bunch of times, I want you just to hire a bunch of fighters and then occasionally hit them lines. And if you haven't done that, I will be annoyed at you. Uh, if you're doing Hamlet, where there's you know there's like a fencing scene at the end, but otherwise it's like a lot of dialogue, you should get actors and then teach them a little bit of fighting. Yeah. Like, for me, when I see, like, sword fighting and movies, I'm just kind of, like, I think I'm just numb at this point. I'm like, whatever. Like, I don't care if it's, like, super accurate or not, as long as it's, like, good at telling the story and is, like, entertaining to watch and stuff, which is, like, a lot of the problems I have with a lot of the fight scenes is they just use the shaky cam way too much because they probably haven't properly trained their actors to to fight really well. So they're trying to cover it up and stuff. That's more, that annoys me more than like the Witcher having their high guard here instead of like 
Oh, oh no, the part about the witcher that annoyed me is that he's holding the sword upside down. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that yeah. whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> like, if but, your, like, post de finestra is off, that's excusable. <laughs> but, like, shit like that, it, like, doesn't bother me. It's probably, like, whatever. It's a fantasy movie, like... As long as it's, I'm entertained, I don't care. But I'm like, I, my bar is probably much lower when it comes to to all, all that stuff. I just want to be able to see the fight. If it's pretty and I can see it all clearly, that's that's my like low bar that movies need to pass. Um, yeah, it's like amazing I, I, I how often that fight, doesn't happen. I want the fight to be like entertaining and well put together. Like I don't expect it to be accurate. Like I expect it to be a good movie fight. Yeah, if you're doing 5,000 jump cuts to cover up the fact that you didn't hire a real choreographer, uh, I know people. I can just bring them onto your set. All <laughs> this problem, man. I think why, like, I like a lot of the the early Tony John movies is that like, he's he is a fighter by trade, so he looks fantastic when he's doing all like his Muay Thai fight combos and stuff, and like his movies will have long five ten minute unbroken fight sequences and stuff with all the stunt actors and it's like really fun to watch and really impressive because he knows what he's doing so they don't have to like cover it up with with like fancy camera shots and angles and stuff like that Um, which i think kind of goes to what you were saying eric in terms of the difference between like american cinema and like european other foreign cinema in which like they get they get fighters and teach Uh, them some acting versus the other one i don't know anything about european cinema in this regard Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was a question that came came earlier. Um, here's one. What's a weapon that you haven't really studied much of that you would like to study more in depth? Or at all. Maybe you haven't studied, be like, man, that weapon looks fucking awesome and I want to pick it up and try some shit. Uh, I think sickles will be fun. I haven't done, it's like the other Myers book, but like, that shit's rad. Sick, sickles are boss. They remember when you came into practice once with a couple, a pair of those and we're like, hey, hey, you want to see something cool? <laughs> and no one died and it was great. Um, no, I've, I've screwed around with the sickles a bit and they are, they are, they are a fucking blast. I think for me, like, so, I've done only a little bit of it is like that Italian dueling saber that like I, before, like I had no interest in saber at all. And I did rasp last year and like fought David Koblenz with it. I'm like, Oh my God, I was hooked. I'm like, I can just, I can kind of wail on my friends here. If I have if they have, if they've padded up enough, this is great. It was awesome. We had sparks flying off the sword. We each got each other good enough in the mass that we could smell the ozone burning. It was it, like it was so it was probably one of the most fun fights I've ever had and it was with this weapon that I literally just picked up basically that weekend so that is that is one I definitely want to study a little bit more in earnest and not just me flail around like a muppet with this really light sword in hand <laughs> uh, Fiori has a chapter more so I want to make this than use it at full speed but he's a chapter on a pole arm with a hollowed out section for blinding powder. Uh, and Guy Windsor put out a couple articles about how this might have been made. That might be a fun journey. That sounds like a fantastic AS project, and I yeah. fully encourage this. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll have to like, check to see if I can bring whatever this plant is on a site. Right. So, like, <laughs> and I'm like, how do I prove that it? Uh, I'm sure there's some of you who are scientists in the comments. How do I prove that this? As people's eyes without doing it to myself. I have enough eye problems as is. Yeah, this might be a thing you can't do at an a at an SEA event, just since we're so like risk adverse. Like there's no way in hell they would ever let you do that. Someone's backyard, fucking go for it. <laughs> oh, I have a friend who is a mounted combat laurel who did a lot of, hey, we took this video at not the SCA. Here is this laptop at the SCA. Please watch our video. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a standing, a, a long standing deal with um, Phelan that at some point 
at an SCA event, we're going to do in, in uh, a Marshall ANS demo where we dig a hole and we, rec yes, and I climb in the hole and do I, do I have the rock in a bag or does she have the rock in a bag? I forget. It's um, her shawl with a rock in it. You have okay. Right. She gets a rock in a bag and I get a stick and we, we just go to town on each other and see how that goes. Frankly, the big reason we haven't done it yet is because neither of us want to dig the hole. That's fair. So like, this sounds like a great, like, fundraiser opportunity <laughs> is that we just throw, we throw mods, we throw knights royalty into a hole and you like pay five bucks and you get to kind of like whale at them with a rock. Well, maybe not a rock. We'll find something, like a basket. I don't know, we'll figure yeah. it out. But you get to whale on them with something in a shawl. It's just like a One nerd soccer ball. Right? big like pre Pensac event, right? So it's always super hot outside. We had a uh, dunk a pier kind of thing. So it was like a dunk tank and just sit whichever pier rolled in on the platform. So this is like the historical version of that. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. It's, it's kind of what my mind was going. <laughs> oh man. So we got about 20 minutes left. We're running through some of the questions that were sent to us earlier. Um, let's see. What is your ideal tournament format and rule set? In general, my answer is I don't give a shit. Tell me what I need to fight with and who I need to fight, and I'll just go do it. Like, what are the win conditions? But I, Yeah, but I want, like, minimum gimmicks. Like, yeah, I mean, sometimes I like gimmick. It depends. Like, I like fun gimmicky tournaments once in a while just to kind of like break it up. I don't need everything to be like the NHL playoff level intensity. Sometimes it's nice just to be in a tournament to fuck around with. But if we're talking about like tournaments that like we want to win, this is like a tournament we actually super give a shit about. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I think with gimmicks, like, if you're going to do gimmicks, go for all of the way and just commit to this being, we're just, Wailing each other with swords is a backdrop to spinning the wheel of chance. That's fine. Uh, I don't want to like, like one of my best friends, uh, like won his first tournament as like a poker card tournament. And was like, oh, I don't get to fight an Ausworn is not because of this hand. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I like to have lots of fighting. I don't have a singular ideal idea of a tournament. Uh, I don't have the greatest love for bear pits. Uh, I realize like they're easy to run. I'm well suited for them, right? Cause it's largely an endurance contest and I just happen to be younger than a lot of the fighters. So I can just go for more <laughs> fights, but they don't encourage good, interesting fights. Uh, so, okay, here, here is an ideal I'd like to see more of. Uh, and I realize I'm not perfect in this and we should all try and do better. I want as many of the fighters as possible, as we all have busy things to do at events, to hang around until the tournament is done. Mm -hmm. Right, because when you're in the finals and everyone's there, oh, that's great. When you're in the finals and like none of your friends are watching you, you have to tell them afterwards, not as interesting. Yeah. So tournaments where everyone is there and is vested in the outcome. That is my ideal tournament. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't I haven't gotten a chance to play with them as much, but the, based on the times I have, I like Bedford Point tournaments mm -hmm. because you know there there's no well you know two fights and you're out right like and. And it, you know, I, ideally, if it works right, it scales to everyone. So explain what they are if anyone is not familiar. Okay, so assuming I remember, assuming I remember the details correctly, everyone gets paired off, and you do three passes or two out of three passes, um, and each each fencer for that set is allocated. A number of points based on how many of those passes you you took um and if you were flawless or if you took a loss or whatever um and it's usually divided up like if it's someone just goes three and oh they get 10 points 
and the other person gets zero. Otherwise, it goes to like seven and three or five and five or whatever. But the, po the point is, at that point, you start pairing people up based on their point totals. So after the first couple rounds, everyone ostensibly should, should be fighting people who have won a similar number of passes that they have. So after, after a couple rounds, you are like a newer fighter is unlikely to like roll up against, you know, Remy in the tournament. Like you're, you're, you're going to end up getting paired against people who are ostensibly of a, of a similar skill level. So you'll get a, a good fight and you won't just get like one shot and be bored. But the other benefit is it just keeps going. Like I know it has a stopping point because I've fought in one and I'm not still fighting in it now. So ostensibly it stops, but like it can just keep rolling. So, so even newer fighters who, if it was like a double elimination tournament, we're just going to, you know, have two or three fights and be bored can just keep fighting and just keep fighting and just keep fighting in it uh, until it's done. So I, I really like those because everyone gets a ton of fights and, you know, everyone should be getting fights which they should ostensibly find interesting or challenging. Yeah, I really like them. Uh, if anyone's Googling this and they want the not SCA term for it, it's called a Swiss tournament. Uh, not a Swiss fight, but it's called a Swiss tournament. All right, like Bedford did not invent this. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the format we used, at least for the first half in like the debate tournaments I did in high school of like power matching your rounds. Uh, the only downside I found, like, I like a good climactic end to the tournament. And so I think, like, if you did that plus, so the way we do, like, debate tournaments is you do those essentially for five rounds, and then it would be, like, a single one bracket. Um, so something, like, you know, I like a good final fight scene to the end of my movie. Yeah. One of the things that, like, I liked about that style when I was, especially when I was a new fencer, is like, yeah, like what Donovan was saying, like I get to fight people that were roughly my skill level. So the fights were challenging, like not too easy, not too hard, you know, that Goldilocks kind of realm. But also like if I had a good day, it was very obvious. It's like, oh, I'm fighting a lot of ogres, a lot of like our grant level awards and stuff. Man, I'm, I'm fighting really well today if I'm getting paired off with all these dons and, 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 and stuff like that. So like, it's kind of cool to like, if you do have kind of level up a little bit, your parents kind of like can kind of like reaffirm affirm that and you don't have to like keep questioning your performance and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think that finding that balance between getting people in a lot of fights, right? Because a lot of styles of tournament, if you're not good, you're done in a couple of rounds and you got one shot at twice. Thanks for showing up. I'm glad you drove five hours. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, like that sucks. Uh, with, so like it's a lot of you get to fight a lot of fights, then you get to fight a lot of good fights, right? Yeah. So it's folks at your level. Uh, the arc, the only real downside is you need a list table who knows what they're doing. Yeah, uh, and you need to. Like, sorry, go ahead. Like yeah, it just as like it requires more admin than like a anything else. Yeah, and like Magdalena was saying this in the, the YouTube chat, is that you need a, a, a good number of fighters to make it worthwhile. Otherwise, you're fighting like the same two or three people over and over and over again. So that's going to kind of vary based on the event and probably kingdom and stuff as well. But yeah, in general, I love, I love that format. Let's see, we got about 10 minutes. We got a question came to YouTube that I thought was pretty good. Uh, what are some of the coolest mid-period or early-period adaptions you've seen brought on the unarmored lists, like Viking, 15th century, Mongol, etc.? So instantly that jumps into my mind is Donovan's provost, uh, Alistair. He does, he's been basically adapting like 133 for Viking. So he's got like his big round shield and he's got like his sacks or whatever, and he's adapting like the 133 techniques and stuff with that, which is a lot of fun to to see that kind of play out. So he would probably be one of the people I say, like, if you want to see something cool like that, definitely hunt him down. 
I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> Not sure if if our has anyone like that like that out there in the in the. I, like I know a couple of people who have messed around with like Viking sword and shield, uh, but yeah, my my big focus is like fifteen thirty yeah. to sixteen ten. So I don't know a lot of people. That, like I know a bunch of furiousts, if that counts. <laughs> That's so uh, mainstream at this point, right? That <laughs> does. Asha's I-33 is great. Go poke her. Um, and Countess Maggie's been doing all of the Persian work, like you said earlier. Yep. Um, and I think I've maybe heard of one other person somewhere around here that's doing that, but not much. Uh, I knew one of the guys when I was out in the East Kingdom was doing some tour work. But I don't know. I can't tell you what century he was okay. pulling from. Yeah. Let's see. Um, if you, oh, here we go. This might this might get some some spicy take. So Donovan Skeen will probably just explode on us. Um, if you could change one rule in SEA Rapier, what would it be? And this might differ by kingdom too, because we do have slight variations in kingdom rules. Wow. What would I change? I don't. Oh, know. I know what mine is. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I want to change the armor standards. I think that we <laughs> live on a planet where global warming is a thing and our biggest event is in August uh, and that we have all of these heat injuries and telling people, hey, go buy a male shirt is gatekeeping and bad. Uh, do I think this will yeah. require more active marshalling? Yes. Do I think it's worth it? A hundred percent. Yeah, I know. I agree with that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Hundred percent. But keep all of the hard pieces. Touch none of that. All right. You know your your hard levels for CNT, your master or J's. Yep. Uh, you're like, you know, like gender slash sex specific like protection. Right. Not changing those things. Those things we all need. Uh I have like some friends who want to go fight barefoot. I have no strong stance one way or the other. Uh, but yeah, wearing a wool doublet or like trying to recreate the little ice age during the age of global warming <laughs> leads to a lot of golf carts with a lot of paramedics. Yeah. Are, are you suggesting we need to move to risk mitigation instead of risk elimination? I'm saying that we're not doing risk elimination. We're doing risk substitution and we're bad at it. I mean, I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> There's a reason I'm running the experiment that I am. <laughs> and it's, well, yeah, especially like after the past couple of years of like not really doing SCA, just doing backyard t-shirt fencing. I'm like, I don't right. want to go back to normal armor standards. Like I've been doing a bunch of this quite safely and very comfortably and not, we haven't had any one drop to like heat stroke or heat exhaustion and stuff. And we've been doing it like out in the sun and like, it's not like it's been cold the last couple of years. So, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's the right. I think that's the the big rule. Yeah. So sorry, not, that's of a spicy take than you wanted. So here's here's oh here's I saw the other one. And so the one thing that like I always get kind of amused by is our two different flex standards for rapier, sand rapier, and C and T. Because. And like I haven't figured out why, maybe someone actually has the answers. I feel why we have those two standards when the calibration for the thrust isn't different. It's still supposed to be at least maybe this is a kingdom by kingdom thing. At least in the east, our thrust for standard rapier and our thrust for C and T isn't any different. But that, but we have two different flex standards, and it, that doesn't matter for a percussive cut at all because I'm not. Yeah. So like that one it fucking annoys me. Yeah, yeah, I think that that. If, if a half inch flex is enough, is safe for me to thrust with, with a long sword, it is safe enough for me to thrust with with a rapier. Like, yeah. that's mine. Yeah. I think I think Eric's is like much better, <laughs> but that's my <laughs> slightly like pet peeve rule change, I suppose. 
<laughs> oh, I'll see. If we, got any, if we have anything else in here? Da, 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 da. Running in a melee, good or bad? Running in engagement, good or bad? Go. I'm, I, oh, I'm all fucking for it. Yeah. As long as you're safe. Yeah. I don't have a value statement around it. Uh, I think it's fine. Yeah. Uh, I think we should be like, because I've seen it go poor. The one time I saw it go poorly, it had just rained. So I think we need, like, again, better awareness, like with a lot of things. Uh, but I also think that, like, adding to the marshals list things to check, hey, are both feet in the air while this person locomotes is, like, not a useful, <laughs> like... I, and I've seen people get dinged for running when they just were taking very fast passing steps. They just move very quickly, but like, cause they move fast. The marshal was like, no running. It's like, well, I got yelled running at the beginning of like a field battle when like, we weren't even near. Oh my God. You guys. Oh God. Like I someone's like, that. no running, like no running. I'm like, I'm not in engagement. I'm not fighting my own side. <laughs> yeah. He was literally running back from the center of the field to his mind as the battle was starting. Yeah, like you guys were like hundreds of feet away and I got yelled at for, for running. I didn't stop. I just yelled back as I'm like, haul an ass back to my squad that's on the wing. But yeah, like in general, I'm like, if you can do it safely, go for it. If you can't and you hurt somebody like anything else, you have to answer for it. I, I think... I think that that is indicative of the trend in the SCA that everyone should be able to do everything that is permitted by the rules. And the SCA does not like telling people that some people can do this thing and other people can't, right? Like you can, you can run in a melee because you can deliver safe shots in it but I can't do it because I'm a monster and my calibration is dog shit, right? Like the SEA was, would never be okay, is generally not okay telling, telling people that sort of thing. So, so you get a lot of lowest common denominator rulings like that that are ostensibly based around safety rather than saying, if you can do it safely, go for it. But if you can't, you're gonna get bounced off the field if you, if you try it because you're a dumbass. Yeah. So this one time in the woods, it was, I think it might've been, it was a couple of pensacks ago in which I was in the woods hauling ass, didn't see anyone and got nailed by someone from the mid round. I don't remember who it was. And they felt, they apologized. Was it you? Oh <laughs> shit. Oh, okay. <laughs> it might've been. I don't know. It was just fun year if I pointed at myself. That was good. <laughs> but like, I got like nailed and they like started apologizing because like, they hit me while I'm running and like, oh no, I'm not supposed to hit you while I'm running. Like, technically I was in the wrong because I was running through engagement. I didn't know because they were hiding behind a tree. So they kind of just like poked around and, and got me and stuff. And I was fine. Like it hit harder than normal, but I was also at a high acceleration. But like we talked, we high-fived. I'm like, well, I'm dead. I will see you guys in about 30 seconds. Did not run back that time. <laughs> So. Right, about two minutes left. Find a spice of your take. Oh, God. I mean, I can try to find another question here. I'm not sure if there's anything. Uh, Aeon asked if we were already touched on more active marshaling versus self reporting. Is that like a good hot take to end on? We kind of talked a smidge about that ish. Oh. Right, here's an interesting power dynamic question. Yeah. I'd like to ask everyone else. Yeah. Uh, so one of, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of like marshals calling people out more often than we see in our current standard. One of the big roadblocks to that, uh, and I'm not trying to paint this system with like a in a single light. I think it, like it has ups and downs, but like one of the issues with our award system is if a person of a lower award calls out someone of a higher reward for bad behavior when they're holding a marshal staff, they know that that might come around to bite them later on if their name comes up in council. Is there anything we can do to solve this or are we just stuck with it as a structural issue? 
I think that that is going to be a structural issue based on the system that we are built around. If, if the people who, and I mean, and it happens all the time in melees, right? Like if the people who are considering some, if the people who are being considered for advancement can potentially discipline the people who will be voting on them, like, I mean, the answer is you tell the people who have those awards to get their heads out of their asses and accept that, hey, you might you might have fucked up there in that melee, lighten up. And even if you, honest to God, think that you didn't, the marshal was probably acting with good intent, get over yourself. But that doesn't fix the systemic issue. So I think based on how we're structured, we're kind of stuck with it. Yeah, the only thing I can think of is that like, the order needs to kind of like police them that issues in the back end if it kind of comes up and stuff but like it's sometimes hard to know people's true intent if they're like saying no if for reasons on somebody so yeah and to yeah. clarify i think the reward system has a lot of benefits like i think it is the reason we don't require judged matches is because we have a cultural pressure external to this fight to not be a dick in this match uh but yeah i think this is like a large issue with it as it stands i don't have the answer yeah i don't i have no idea either other than like <laughs> we blow up the entire sca rules not rule set but like award structure and stuff from scratch my own SCA, classic. No, right. uh, and nah. then we'll make new systemic issues that were like yeah. just didn't foresee okay. <laughs> yeah around. New and interesting mistakes. Yeah. All right. So we've been doing this for two hours. We have. So, Good lord. I know. Look, you have things to say about swords. <laughs> swords are cool. I miss sorting with all my friends. We had that brief window when I could sword with all my well, mo some of my friends, a large yeah. portion. And now we're back to you stuck indoors. Yeah, I went from fighting four times a week to fighting no times a week. Yeah, and like, so we have, technically we have like our Kings and Queens Rapier Champion next month, and like, it would be nice if there was some practices we might be able to do between now and then, assuming uh, that it's still going to happen, because who yeah. knows? Yeah, uh, you know, I wish your kingdom the best of luck <laughs> at attaining numbers to make that event feasible, independent of practices. Yeah. Last time I fought it was in 2020, so it's literally been almost two whole years, it was Burka, so at the end of January of 2020. That was the last time yeah, I fought yeah, you still champion, though? Donovan's champ. Yeah, that's what I was asking yeah. him. Yeah. Sorry to hear the name you said. Okay, I can tell the part. <laughs> yeah, Donovan still is. is, is yeah. champ. Donovan's been, I think, he's the longest reigning Keen's champ. I think you're also with the shortest reigning I Keen's am. champ. I, I was I was champion when we changed the date. So I was I had like a six month term and then I had this never ending hellscape. Well. <laughs> well anyways, hopefully this will all be over soon. He says cautiously, optimistically, and eye rolling me. Uh, I'm making predictions. It's my stance. Yeah, yeah right. Oh, this is great. It's great to actually like yeah. seeing you both. I mean, I see Donovan once in a while. Well, you know, geography. Like, yeah, yeah. But it's good to see you, Eric. It's been great. And like, it was nice seeing a whole bunch of familiar faces and names in the chat, too. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah. I haven't heard from like Cretchen in forever. And he just like popped out in the, in the chat. And right? stuff. So yeah, this is great. Him. Yeah, yeah, I saw Ernesto was hanging out there, David Biggs. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh, so Looked like, look like a good group of people there. Yeah. yeah, they're all, they're all right. Let's not. We don't want to say t t too much nice things about them. Just a little bit. Huh, I don't know. <laughs> all right, so maybe we'll, depending on like how long this shutdown goes of practices, maybe we'll do another one of these and with more spicy, spicy hot takes for Donovan's webcam to rebel against. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, and next time maybe I'll just use my my work computer to do this since I never have a problem with that. So yeah, yeah or just plug the Ethernet straight in. Yeah, I'll just drill a couple holes on my floor and just like string the cords <laughs> straight up. That seems fine. That'll go over well. I don't know your setup. I haven't been to your house. You never invite me over. 
All right. It's true. I haven't. I never do. <laughs> All right. And I think on that note, I will end the stream. We're technically on a 20 second delay. So I need to like wait the awkward 20 seconds. Otherwise it will cut us off part way through. So we'll just kind of like hang out here. I know this is in 20 seconds, but this is probably long enough that no one's going to give a shit about us just trying to trail off. Anyways, well, thanks I everybody. <laughs> I have the YouTube yeah. opened, and I'm realizing that like I mirrored the opposite way there. <laughs> my hair goes one direction, and it's very strange. <laughs> All right, stream is.